Thank you. And I should also put in here that the reason I'm doing this session is that I'm the medical director of the 22Q clinic in Atlanta. Okay, so we have our own multidisciplinary clinic in Atlanta, and we have genetics, we have a gastroenterologist and endocrinologist, and I'm an immunologist. And it's housed in a clinic that also has the cranial facial center to deal with speech and palate issues, the dentist who deals with all the dental issues, and cardiology that deals with all the heart issues. So it's really a very multidisciplinary clinic, which is really kind of unique because I'm sure as you probably have experienced, a lot of clinics will have a couple different practitioners, but then you may be there and then go down to that clinic down there and that clinic across the street and that clinic upstairs. And we are, we try to be as integrated as we can so that we try to make it, you know, as, as one stop as we can, which is not always possible, but we try it very hard. So, you know, I, I, Originally, when they told me this, they said, well, tell us, you know, what's new. And unfortunately, I don't know that there's a ton that's really new in George. I mean, I think, you know, you're, it's a small group are probably familiar with this. Is, it's, it's a perplexing syndrome. It's funny because it's a very common syndrome, but yet a lot of pediatricians don't know about it. And a lot of internists don't know about it at all. They've never heard of this. And part of the reason is because there's so many different ways it shows up. I mean, it can, in fact, I tell my patients when I see them for the first time, well, we're just going to check you from your hair to your toenails because it can affect basically every system in your body. Now, a lot of our patients in the pediatric realm come to us from the cardiac, from the cardiac surgery unit because they have a heart defect. And in fact, about almost 70% of patients with DeGeorge will have a heart defect. So it's a very common way to get them picked up. But more and more and more, we are seeing older kids, 7, 12, 13, that are being referred to us because of speech problems, because of learning problems, because of other issues and not those issues. So it is really a difficult, sometimes different, difficult syndrome. However, it's the most common deletion syndrome in humans. It's more common than Prader-Willi, it's more common than Williams syndrome, and a lot of these other syndromes that you hear a lot about. Um, oops. Now, most of we call this 22Q11 deletion syndrome. That also creates confusion because that accounts for 90% of the patients that look like this. There's another 10% that don't have a deletion in chromosome 22Q11. So what do we call them? Sometimes we call them DeGeorge syndrome. And sometimes we call them velocardial facial syndrome. They all have the same syndrome. It just means that some of them have this deletion and 10% don't. Now, that being said, it's an oncel dominant defect. So that means that there's no carrier. You have it or you don't have it. And this is something that we'll talk at the end about reproductive counseling and things like that because this is a very difficult issue sometimes to get home to affected patients that there's no carrier. There's your, it's a 50-50 chance you're going to spread, you're going to share this with somebody. So most of our patients don't have an affected parent. Only about 10, maybe 15% will have an effective parent. So what do we know? Well, we know that 90% you know, of the patients have a deletion. And this is just a picture. The blue shows you the fish. And you can see in the, in the lower one, it's a little bit easier to see how that there's sort of two green dots and only one red dot. And that's showing you that there's only one copy of the 22Q. Now, the, the crazy picture below it is what's called a chromosomal microarray, and some people may have heard that term, and it makes confusion because they don't know, well, I had a genetic testing that didn't show it. Well, that's a genetic testing that tells you how many pairs of chromosomes do you have. Do you have 23? Do you have trisomy 21? It doesn't tell you this because this is a little piece of DNA that's missing. So microarrays became available to us probably about maybe seven or eight years ago. One of the advantages of a microarray is it tests for thousands of genes, okay? Now, you may say, oh, well, that's really overkill if I think they're DeGeorge, but a lot of times the reason we do this is because we're not 100% sure that they're DeGeorge. And the other nice thing about a microarray is a microarray tests for several regions in the 22Q gene, and it's a big deleted region. It's three megabases. So mega is 100,000. It's huge for a deletion. So you think, well, why? Why can't we see it with regular chromosome testing? We can't. It's big, but it's not that big. So this splits it, and it allows us to tell, well, is it the big, big one, or is it the smaller one? Or is it something kind of sort of in between? 
We're not yet at the point where knowing the size of the deletion tells us what's going to be wrong with the child because the two don't correlate very well. But we're working towards that, towards figuring out how these things relate, how the, how the type of gene defect you have relates to what you see. So we're learning a little bit more about outcomes. So remember that the original fish tests were invented in the 90s. So we're only getting to the point now where we are seeing adults that are 30, 40, 50 years old who have this, who we know have this deletion. They're out there, but we didn't know it. So we had all these adults that had heart defects and they had them repaired, and nobody could ever figure out why they had trouble in high school, why they had speech problems, why they had all these things. And then we went back and we tested all these adults who had tetralogy flow and things and found there were a large number of them that had 22Q deletion. So they're there, and we're trying to get the word out to the internists and to the cardiologists, especially. In the adults, you still need to look for this, because don't assume it was diagnosed, because it was probably missed. So treatment-wise, we'll talk in a second about that. You know, there are things that we've been doing for a long time. We know we fix hearts. The surgeons come up with new ways to fix things all the time. There are a few things that, you know, haven't really changed how we treat reflux, how we treat, you know, ear infections, things like that. And then there are some other things that they've been tweaking how we fix the, the, the difficulty swallowing, how do we deal with the speech issues, and then some of the neuropsychiatric issues that we're looking at. And then there are some other considerations, so we'll talk about those. There's some other diseases that people don't necessarily think about with this syndrome, but we think that they're important. So, you know, outcomes, you know, most of the babies die in the first year of life because of their heart problem. Not because they have, quote, de George, but because they have a very complicated heart defect that's not easily fixed, and they succumb because of complications from that, not because of their calcium levels or things like that. Um, there are lots of other conditions associated, but rarely are they life-threatening. Hypothyroidism is not life-threatening. IgA deficiency is not life-threatening. So they definitely impact your life, but they don't really necessarily shorten your lifespan all that much. So the major limitation to how long you live has to do with how good your heart functions. Okay. Um, you know, there's, not, like I said, not a lot of studies that look at long-term outcomes. There's been a couple recently published in the past couple of years from Europe and from the U.S. looking at patients not that old. I'm talking maybe 20, 25, so not 50. And they're, they're reporting about 8 to 10% of them developing autoimmune disease. 30 to 40% have an anxiety disorder, which we all know when we see the kids. I mean, the parents tell us this, that the kids are tremendously anxious. And then, rather disturbing, up to 40% of the males will develop some psychosis, usually schizophrenia. So it's a very high proportion of patients that develop schizophrenia with this syndrome. And this has really spurred a lot of research in this area into trying to figure out what are some of the contributing factors that lead to that, and is there anything that we could do that would interrupt that early on and maybe make that less likely to happen. So treatment, I said, you know, heart repairs, we do surgery, we close the holes, we fix the vessels as best we can, we re, re, re hook them back up again. The speech things, this is an area where there's a lot of still discussion debate. So, you know, patients with DeGeorge have very hypernasal speech. They have that because their throat's very deep. And so when they talk and they try to say buh and uh, oops, sorry, they can't make a nice stop here. I call it, people call it a glottic stop, but it's so you make pressure. They say buh, nuh, it's too big, the space back there. So what they do is a surgery called a pharyngoplasty. And what they do is basically take the muscles that are in the back there and they basically bring them forward a little bit and close that space a little bit. So instead of your throat being back out here, you bring it in so it's here. And that improves speech markedly in the majority of patients who have that surgery. So it works quite well. The problem is, is that not all ENTs understand this problem because a lot of these kids also have sleep apnea. And it's not because of their big adenoids. Their big adenoids make their speech better. So there's a lot of controversy about when you do these surgeries, should you take out their adenoids, should you take out their tonsils? And our ENTs who deal with this all the time tell us no. And now I'll tell you in a minute, there, there was at least one or two studies that looked at 
the effect of adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy in these patients in their speech. Scoliosis is another frequent thing that we see, and I think a lot of people don't recognize it, but up to 6% of these kids will need a surgical repair for scoliosis, which is about two and a half times higher than the normal population. So it's, it's another common pediatric problem, but it's something that you have to be mindful in this condition. Now, the other problem is, you know, most, some of them will have low calciums. We just treat it, we give them calcium and vitamin D, thyroid supplementation if they have low thyroid, there's nothing new there. And then the immune defects. So for some time, Dr. Marker at um, Duke has done thymus transplants if they have no thymus, which is less than 1% of kids. And there were, there's a paper that came out about six, seven years ago looking at the B-cell problem. So we always think of this as a problem with your thymus and your T-cells. But it turns out that there are a lot of patients, and we've known this for a long time because we saw them, that they get a lot of infections. And it's because their B-cells don't work quite the way they should. So we have found that we need to supplement some of them with gamma globulin. Okay. So... One of the big questions that's always plagued us is, how come we can see 100,000 different manifestations of this syndrome when it's the same genetic defect? Why, why is it that you have the same deletion, but everybody looks different? Because I tell my patients, every single one of my patients in my clinic looks different. I don't have any two that look the same. And because we don't really understand that, do we have a way of predicting who's going to get autoimmune disease? Who's going to get schizophrenia? Who's going to have behavioral problems? Who's going to have big speech problems and big learning problems and who's not? And the answer is maybe we're getting a little bit better at predicting some of these things, but we've still got a long way to go. So the autoimmune disease. Now it turns out that about 8 to 10 percent will develop autoimmune disease, usually by about five, six years of age. Okay? And those are mostly low white blood cells low platelets, low hemoglobin, things which are not necessarily uncommon in kids, but are more common in this syndrome. And they can also develop low thyroid. Now, the low thyroid can be because the thyroid gland is not formed properly, but we think that a lot of cases is because they have antibodies against their thyroid glands. So they actually have an autoimmune thyroiditis. And then some of them will actually get like rheumatoid arthritis type symptoms. And so it's not a big percentage, but it is higher than the normal population. So what we think is that if you have a small thymus gland and your T cells are not educated properly, then you let these autoreactive or these T cells that react against yourself get out into the body. You don't destroy them because that's the job of your thymus. I tell people that thymus is the schoolhouse for T cells. It's where they learn how to behave themselves. Um, so there was a recent study by the people at CHOP that looked at the T cell populations in these patients and found that they don't have um, as many what we call naive T cells, which are cells that are made, they're, they're new babies from the thymus compared to other patients. So that might be a way that we can look at patients to predict who might be more at risk for developing autoimmune disease. So that part of it needs to be borne out. So this part, We've, we, we know from looking backwards at people, now we need to look forwards at people and, and test a bunch of people and then watch them over several years to see, is that what happens? Are those kids, so can we look at a profile and say, when they're three, oh, you don't have very many naive T cells, you might develop autoimmune disease, okay? So, so that's one thing that might be possible. Now, there's been a lot of debate about doing periodic screening, but we do some very basic screening all the time, and we don't really call it that. But we get a blood count on kids regularly. That helps tell us if the platelets are low, if the hemoglobin's low. We do check their thyroid. You know, we usually do it several times. You know, we do it when they're babies a few times. We do it when they're in like kindergarten age, and then we do it when they're older. And that's kind of screening for low thyroid. So that helps us tell if it's low, and then if it looks like it's low, then we can look to see if they have antibodies against the thyroid gland. So speech, speech is a big issue. About 70% of patients have speech problems. Some of them just have kind of indistinct speech. This is very hypernasal speech. Some of them 
really have trouble speaking. They may have a submucous cleft palate, so the food is always coming out the nose when they're babies. Um, and then a lot of them will have obstructive sleep apnea. So this is not a little bit of snoring. This is like they they can't get the air in. So you know we need to see guys who need CPAP machines in there, like that. That's what is happening with these kids. And again, so this is where there's a big controversy because in a lot of kids who have obstructive sleep apnea, they think, oh, it's because their adenoids are too big and their tonsils are too big, and that's why they're doing it. Now, so there have been, if you look at our literature, the ENT has one opinion, <laughs> and we have a different opinion. And so, but there was a recent paper from an ENT group that actually kind of rode the middle road and actually made sense. So they said, well, if the tonsils are big, it makes sense to take the tonsils out because they won't affect the speech. But you don't touch the adenoids. And rarely are the adenoids so big that they're the ones causing the obstruction. It's a muscular problem. So what happens is the muscles are very lax back here. And when they lay back to sleep, it's like that's what causes most grown-ups to have sleep apnea. Everything just pancakes down. So you can't get the air through. So they favor either doing some surgery to strengthen that back wall, but leave the adenoids alone. And so this is something that we always have to argue. And unfortunately, we have to often come in after the fact when they've already seen the ENT for their ear tubes and they just took out the adenoids because that's what they like to do. But we're trying to get the word out to make sure that you know they are, they're aware of this. And we're trying to make sure the parents are aware when they go tell your ENT, it's okay, you can leave the adenoids there, don't touch them. And then, you know, the delayed speech development, a lot of kids will be slow talking, some will not talk at all until they're four or five. There's a lot of controversy about should you teach them to sign. So, on the one hand, at least they learn how to communicate, because they understand everything you're saying to them. But they can't communicate, so imagine how frustrating that is to not be able to communicate what you want. Why do you think to toddlers have tantrums? because they can't communicate what they want. So they need to be able to communicate. I personally have not seen any kids who've learned to sign where it's really impaired their language development. They know the words. They know it in their head. It's just, for whatever reason, their ability to put it out and say it is not there. So I don't think that signing changes that. I think it improves their ability to be in an environment in school and to communicate with other people. Um, so schizophrenia. So this is always, you know, big, big, big concern of families. And it's, it's a hard conversation to have because it's a really tough topic. And unfortunately, there have not been a lot of resources out there. There's now a lot of centers that have dedicated programs. Like in, in Atlanta, we have the Marcus Autism Center, which now finally recognizes that kids with 22Q have autistic-like features. They are not autistic but they have many of the same features and they respond very well to many of the same therapies. We have a couple of psychiatrists who are very, very involved in research on schizophrenia in young adults and have been looking at potential causes of schizophrenia in DeGeorge. So we've been looking at calcium levels in patients when they're babies to see if that correlates with developing schizophrenia later on because you need calcium for the talk, crosstalk between your cells and your brain. So there was a recent consortium with a bunch of centers in Europe, and they found, you know, no big surprise. I mean, everybody knows a lot of these kids seem to be kind of hyperactive. And, you know, th there was a rate of 41% of psychosis in patients over 25, which is pretty high, much higher than the normal population. We see a lot of anxiety disorders. They're not, these patients don't get bipolar. They may be depressed and anxious but they're not usually manic. And then we, ha we do a developmental, in our clinic, we do a developmental screening on behavioral issues after a year of age. So we start very early looking for those features that look like autism, autistic-like features, and then we do it again later on, looking for early features that may suggest, okay, there may be a potential for developing schizophrenia or other psychosis, okay? so. This is something that if your program doesn't do that, you might need to ask them, hey, you know, how can I go about getting screened for these disorders? Because I think every patient should have it, even if they seem to be the sweetest kid ever. You don't know. When they hit adolescence, because that's when these, these psychosis things tend to show up, teenagers are moody and ugly anyhow. 
So sorting that out from the psychosis, not always easy, okay? But that's one of the, the things that, they, that the psychiatrists tell us when you see somebody that suddenly starts becoming more withdrawn, more moody, more isolated, having more difficulties with school and with their peers, you need to look at that. I mean, it may just be adolescence, but you don't know. So some of the other things, sleep problems. You know, I hear a lot about these kids. They don't like to go to bed. They stay up all night. They get up. They wander around the house. They are a lot in that way like some of the autistic kids. Their body clock is just completely off. They would be up at night and sleep all day if you let them. When they're teenagers, it's even harder because teenagers normally their body clock likes to be like that. They like to go to bed late and they like to get up late. And it's worse with this. So we had a woman in Alabama that did a sleep study and she looked at a bunch of teens with 22Q. The average time they went to bed, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. But you know, they were able to work their schedule so that they could be accommodated. They were in some sort of flexible schooling so they could go to school at 10 o'clock in the morning. Not everybody can do that. So what do you do if, you're, you, know, if you don't have that kind of flexibility? Well, you gotta work some little deals out there so you can manage within that schedule. It is much harder. So what it means is that some of these kids when they grow up should not look for jobs that start like a nurse at six o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock in the morning. They are not gonna do well in that job. They may do great in like night shift, evening shift, perfect, okay? Um, Learning disabilities. Learning disabilities are usually related to nonverbal things. So if you give them verbal instructions, they're usually pretty okay with that. They may have some, some memory issues in terms of their short-term memory sometimes is not the best, but they have a lot of trouble absorbing written instructions and other types of instruction, okay? And then the dental issues. So I don't see a lot of people talking about dental issues in these patients, but we have a very good dentist who, who does a great job with these kids, and he sees them as soon as that first tooth comes out. Why? Because most of these patients have problems with their enamel in their teeth. So they get cavities. If we wait until they're three to send them to the dentist, they have a mouth full of rotten teeth, and they need lots of them pulled out, and they need root canals. That's not a good way to start. So the, this was a study that was actually done by a bunch of dentists. They, they said basically what you see in these patients is the enamel doesn't form well, it's not mineralized well, so the teeth are very soft. It has nothing to do with calcium levels. They can have perfectly normal calcium and the teeth can still be rotten. So we don't quite understand why because they don't get fractures, they don't have other problems with their bone density, but the enamel is very poorly formed in the teeth. Now, this article says that that persists lifelong. I will just say that my experience has been that usually the adult teeth are better than the baby teeth. They don't seem to be as prone to decay, but maybe we just have gotten them in the habit of seeing the dentist very often and cleaning the teeth very well, so they're taking better care of their teeth when they're a bit older. But I will tell you that the baby teeth are tough. They are very tough. And then back, a question I get all the time, is it okay to give them live vaccines? Okay, because we have this, modern pediatricians will have this idea that you can't give any kid with this syndrome live vaccines. So when can you give them live vaccines? Almost every time. There's only a very few exceptions, probably less than 5% of the kids that we wait and that's only if they have a really big immune system problem. And then the genetic counseling. So remember I told you that this is an autosomal dominant thing, which means that if you have it, you have a 50-50 chance, and it doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl, that they're gonna have it. And it's 50-50 each time you have a pregnancy. So it, some, some of our patients think, well, okay, so I had one kid who has it, so the next kid will have it. No, it doesn't work like that. You, it depends on how lucky you are. You might have no kids that have it, you, all your kids might have it. The other thing that's very hard to explain to patients is that no matter what their defect is, it might be just a little speech defect, maybe a cleft, the child almost always has more problems than the parent. And in fact, many of the parents that we diagnose are diagnosed because we have a child that has calcium, heart problems, whatnot. The parent has none of that. They didn't know they had 22Q. So we recommend routinely to test both parents even if they don't seem like they have much in the way of symptoms. Because we have seen some extremely mildly affected parents. And so they had no idea. So why would they think they're gonna have a child with this syndrome? 
So what's new? Like I said, not a lot. So there's this work done by some people, actually Dr. Dilla Moreno, who's here looking at genes that might modify or change how this segment is expressed. And then one of the other big things, which I think impacts us a lot more, is this sort of dissemination of what we call guidelines for care. So I've been, this was in the journal Pediatrics, this article, and I have a reference to it, but um, I have been sending this out by email, by hook and by crook to like every pediatrician who sends me patients so that they have this list. And I, I have it at the end, so I'll share it with you. But the modifier gene idea is that, I told you, this is the same thing, it's always deleted. So why does everybody look different? Well, there are lots and lots of genes in this region. It's a huge region. I mean, there's probably about 20 different genes in it. And there are other genes, we call them microRNAs, which control how those genes are actually relayed. And so it may be that if you have certain types of these microRNAs or you don't have them, you can't really express the genes of that are on the normal copy. So you don't have enough of it to correct for the missing one copy, because we always have two copies of everything. You're missing one copy here. Well, if you have these modifiers, then the normal genes can't be expressed like they should. And maybe that's when you see the heart defects, the calcium defects, and things like that. And this study actually looked at a bunch of patients and did see kind of a pattern of a shift. And so maybe that that's a possible explanation. Is there anything we can do about it? Potentially, because if we know that there's a pattern there, then it opens up the door for potentially therapy, but it would have to be done while the, you know, they were in utero, basically. Um, there are other possible genes that have been suggested over the years based on studies with mice. They haven't really panned out. So this is the, the little chart that I was talking about. So this is kind of lifted from that paper. And what I, what I want you to see is how that it really differs by age, and this is the main thing. So when we first see patients, and I put a diagnosis because, like I said, di a diagnosis, I don't care how old they are, you know, they can be five, they can be five months, they can be 15, it's still everything. So we look at the, the endocrine stuff, the calcium, the thyroid, we look at the T cells, we look at their speech, and we have our ENT or someone check the palate to make sure they don't have a cleft back there, and we have the dentist start seeing them as soon as they have teeth. So if they're at diagnosis and they're an infant, well, you know, they have no teeth yet, too soon. But if they're two and they haven't seen a dentist yet, they go to the dentist. Everybody gets a renal ultrasound because the frequency of kidney defects is high in this, much higher than the population, normal population. Everybody gets an echocardiogram to look at their heart and make sure there's no defects, even if they don't have a heart murmur. Because we see some subtle kind of defects. Maybe there's a blood vessel that goes off in the wrong direction or, you know, some other like a valve that's kind of misshapen a little bit, not enough to cause a big problem now, but maybe as you grow it might be a problem. Looking at the C-spine is important because some of them will have a short little prong at the top of it, which is a problem because the way your skull fits on your, your neck bone, it rocks on this little bone. And if that's really short, there's a possibility that if somebody hits you too hard or you extend your neck too hard, you might actually fly it off. So it can, be a, it, it can be a potential thing. It's not normally a problem, but doing an X-ray of the C-spine, it's easy. You just have to wait till they're you know, a little bit older so that it's completely mineralized, the bone, because you can't see this in babies. Scoliosis check, really important. Pediatricians do this routinely in the older kids, but I have seen kids as young as seven and eight with DeGeorge start to show significant scoliosis. So that should be checked starting pretty young, younger than we would normally. Um, Eye exams we recommend routinely. There's no real particular eye defects we're looking for, but, but a lot of kids will have trouble with nearsightedness and, and you know, eyes that cross or things like that. So we just have them go to the eye doctor. Genetic counseling is very important. It's important when they get diagnosed, but then it's important later on. And this is, leads into always these tough conversations about reproductive choices for affected patients. So. We have a lot of families because these kids, many of them tend to be a little bit awkward in their social skills. They may not understand about things. They may be developmentally behind the other kids, but physically they're as mature as everybody else. So the parents recognize that this is not a child who can take care of another, of a baby who's got complex medical needs. And they need to know 
they, they need to be able to have a frank discussion about what their options are. And honestly, sometimes what the options are depend on the state you live in, what they will and won't allow you to do. We've had good luck with allowing, uh, having um, the, the gynecologists put in things like the Depo Provera in girls. Guys is a little bit harder because we don't have that kind of sort of long-term birth control for the boys. But this is a discussion that one needs to introduce at home and with the doctor as soon, like probably predating puberty even, just thinking about it a little bit in advance. Because as soon as puberty hits, then the risk exists for them to become pregnant or to get someone else pregnant. Um, developmental and school issues. So developmental issues, usually their, their muscle motor development's fine. It's the behavioral stuff. It's the speech things, the things like that. We tell parents early on, you know, get a school assessment, get an individual education plan in place. We have, within our program, through the Marcus Autism Center, we have some school experts, some neuropsychologists that do testing for the schools so that we can help get patients the education they need. The older teens, many of them are mainstream. They go to high school. They complete high school. But many of them will go into sort of vocational programs. A lot of them have particular aptitudes for computers or music. You know, and, and we just funnel them wherever their aptitude seems to be because that's where they feel good about what they're doing and where they have the most likelihood of success. And then we look afterwards, after high school, either vocational training, two-year programs, some of the kids are in four-year programs, but it just depends on the kid because there's such a variety of, of levels of, of ability. And then we talked a little bit about the psychiatric and emotional, just kind of thinking about it, watching them. If there's something that starts to happen that you're like, you know, that's not, that's new or that's changed or I wonder what that is. Talking to the physicians, seeing if they have someone who can do a behavioral assessment on them to see if there's something going on there that we need to deal with. So, so that's basically, you know, as you can see, when you're doing this soup to nuts, it's important to have a, what I call a quarterback. Often the immunologist ends up being the quarterback on the quarterback on our team. Um, but it's really important that the team members talk to each other. Because if the GI doctor doesn't know anything about 22Q, well, somebody needs to educate them. And it's nice if the whole team can work together so that you're not at, at odds with what other people are doing. And then the other thing that I encourage everyone, and that's gonna be in my talk about teens, about young adults, is create an e-health record for these patients. You know, IDF has an e-health record. There are other systems out there, but get it all down because they need to have access to their records and you need to be able to remember, oh gosh, how many, you know, palate surgeries have they had? I don't know. You know, it's a lot to keep together. Um, you know, advocacy is, you know, advocacy for your child, but also for programs, whether it is screening. So newborn screening has been something that's been talked about for this because of the skid screening that we're doing. I know they talked this morning, I think, about skid screening. And they pick up a lot of kids with DeGeorge, a, a good number, probably more than they do with skid for that screen, quite honestly. And you know, that's one of my interests is we've been working on a test that we can do for, to screen the blood spots for 22Q deletion, which hopefully we'll get funded to pilot it. But you know, these are things that on, on a family level, you know, raising your voice and saying, yeah, you know, it would have been good to know this when my child was born, you know, because of the running around to different people trying to figure out what's going on, what do I need, why is this happening, that would be helpful. And then, you know, thinking to the future, you know, what are we going to do when they get ready and they turn 18? How are we going to deal with that? Especially if they are not a child who's capable of making their own medical decisions, you have to put measures in place, guardianship, you know, medical power of attorney, things like that. So those are longer term conversations and I don't know, you know, where people are at in their stage with their kids, but it's gonna come for everybody, you know. So it's something that people need to think about and I don't think a lot of people know how that road's supposed to go, you know, but there are often, um, people out there, either people who work for like the HELP Law, which is one of these voluntary law partnerships at, in the hospitals, 
they often can give advice about how do you set up a guardianship, how do you set up a power of attorney, things like that. But those are important things to know about. So, so anybody have any questions? <laughs>